The testimony of Elizabeth Heaps on EphrataMinistries.org I'll never wear one of those things, were the words from my mouth years ago to some Mennonite friends. Where does it say that in the Bible? They told me where. My prayer became, O oh Lord, why me? You convict my heart if it's true and I'll obey. They were only words, but in time the need for obedience was to follow, and that's where it got very difficult. Every fleshly argument prevailed. My husband laughed at each one and said, Why don't you stop fighting and just obey? It was not the head veiling itself that was my stumbling block, but all the things it represented. Dying to the flesh and to the desire to be accepted. Standing out, being judged for religious bondage, for real submission to my husband. And in spotlighting different areas that weren't submitted. Ouch. I had to ask the Lord to deal with and cleanse my rebellious heart and to help me simply obey Him, despite all the circumstances and the emotions and feelings that were so intense. He gave me First Peter over and over again through my struggles. Yet it was so very simple and peaceful once I put it on physically and spiritually. And following my obedience, God has blessed to reveal much more fully the deep meanings of His own covering over me personally and through my husband. Instead of religious bondage, it has meant spiritual freedom. For God so blesses a simple obedience to his word. In such obedience, he gives us a glimpse into some of the mysteries and ways in which he covers his faithful children from both the enemy and ourselves. And I praise God for that. Amen. Howdy, folks. Welcome to today's Corinthian Church. We are studying through the book of 1 Corinthians. You can find these study videos in two online locations on speakthegoodword.com, on my YouTube channel by searching Samuel Troyer. The title for today's study is A Sign of Authority. Our study text is 1 Corinthians 10. I'm sorry, it's 1 Corinthians 11, verses 2 to 16. The teaching on the Christian's head covering is not new to most of you in this audience. If you are Mennonite or have been around conservative Mennonite people, you've seen it. You've seen it practice. You grew up with it, maybe. I believe it is important, however, to solidify our understanding on this topic. If this is a new concept to you, I hope you will be challenged and blessed. Some of you will be exposed to folks, especially those who are leaving a conservative Mennonite setting, who are going to be explaining to you that Paul doesn't really mean what he says in the first half of Corinthians 11. These folks will try to justify their newfound freedom to you and maybe even convince you as they try to assuage their own conscience in making the changes that they are making and taking off the head covering. The first half... 1 Corinthians 11 is perhaps the most explained away portion of Scripture of all time. So much effort, especially in the past hundred years or so, has been expended in explaining that this passage can't possibly mean what it says, or that it is merely a cultural issue of that time and doesn't apply to our setting today. That if Paul were writing to our church that this would not be one of his concerns. There is so much avoidance, so much running away from clear teaching, so much hardening of conscience. The reason for all of this explaining and rationalizing is not because this passage is so terribly difficult to understand. It is, it is a bit confusing in places. The reason for explaining away is not because the scripture teaching is vague, however. It is because it is inconvenient to our lifestyle and perhaps to our vanity. It doesn't say what many wish it would. I'm disappointed in the teaching of some of our prominent evangelical teachers of today, men whose reputation you are aware of, whose names you would recognize, men who are learned in exegesis and hermeneutics and are scholars of the Word, they go directly against their own Bible study criteria in studying 1 Corinthians 11. There's nothing here that would justify our dismissing this passage as applying only to the first century and not to us. Faithful hermeneutics demand for us to consider this passage as timeless, 
There are a few notable exceptions out there. Non Mennonite folks who are not afraid to stand out. R.C. Sproul Jr. Uh, made a, uh, I want to share a quote from R.C. Sproul Jr. He says, The church has rejected this practice in the last 30 or 40 years, not because of new interpretive insights, but because of pressure from the world. Generally, until 50 years ago, every woman in every church covered their head. What has happened in the last 50 years then? We've had a feminist movement. And then there's David Phillips. I've read his book called Cover Glory, which I would recommend uh, if you are in, really into studying the subject some more. He stands out in his literal interpretation and uh, obedience to this, this concept. So why has the Western Church largely moved away from the head covering in worship? It did not come with a clearer understanding of Scripture. We mentioned that earlier. That was not the driver for this change. What has changed? I do a lot of troubleshooting, or I have done, in my day job. When I see a confusing symptom showing up in a mechanical system, I need to ask, what changed? Why is this system not functioning as it had? Can I duplicate this change and find out what needs to happen to fix it? I'll tell you what has changed. The advent of Western Christianity's problem with a woman's head covering for worship corresponds almost completely and directly with the women's liber movement of the 20th century, not with a clearer understanding of Scripture. Freedom from authority is represented in our Western culture by an uncovered head and free-flowing hair. Nobody can tell me what to do, and I'm nobody's personal vassal. Thank you very much. I am woman. I will answer to nobody. I am woman. Hear me roar. When I start explaining away clear scriptural commands, I have slipped, started down a slippery slope. That is a dangerous approach to scriptural interpretation. It is the improper use of hermeneutics. Next, we will accept other parts of our ungodly culture, and there will be no stopping us from sliding into hell in a handbasket. Witness the Mennonite Church over the past few decades. Witness even the acceptance of the homosexual lifestyle by some Mennonite churches. If we, know, if we do not go back to the Word as the clear authority, we will not end up in a good place. I want to share with you some pictures that David Berceau, many of you know of him, uh, discovered in his research. The church has practiced a head covering for women, at least for public worship, down through the years up until recently. The early church fathers testified to that fact. Uh, Clement of Alexandria does. He, li he, he lived from A.D. 150 to 250. And Tertullian also does, from A.D. 160 to 220. And there are pictures, as you see on the screen, in the catacombs under Rome that depict women with coverings. And that would have been very early in uh, the persecution of the Christians uh, in the catacombs under Rome. And then we move, skip ahead to the 800s in England. You'll see a depiction here of a woman with a covering. In the 1400s in England, the 1500s in Europe, the 1600s in Europe, 1620 in New England, the Pilgrims, 1750 in Europe, the 1800s in Europe, uh, I believe at this point, up at this point, it became more of a fashion state and perhaps than a covering. The 1800s in this country. In 1948, a photo was taken of a Presbyterian worship service. They were observing communion. And you'll notice the head coverings that were present in that worship service in the, in the Presbyterian church in 1948. Christian women in India and many East 
Eastern Christian churches continue the practice of wearing uh, veilings for worship. And of course, the Amish and conservative Mennonites in this country. More recently, I became aware of a movement called the Head Covering Movement. Some of you are observing a recent revival of the head covering practice among a few Protestant churches, just a few, in the Head Covering Movement at headcoveringmovement.com. It's interesting to follow this movement in their discovery of the truth of Scripture. It's refreshing, almost like watching infants who are learning new truths that have been there all this time. It is so important to reverence God's Word. We dare not pick and choose. One of the things the conservative Mennonites are known for is for being sticklers for the Word. This is good. This is the way it should be. I personally am committed to teaching the Word accurately and under the direction of the Holy Spirit. I will be faithful to my calling as a teacher of the Word. I don't have an agenda beside that. May God direct us in our study of the Word together. I covet your prayer support. Okay, we want to look at our study text for today and read it from 1 Corinthians 11, verses 2 to 16, and we'll be reading from the English Standard Version. A little bit of background. It seems that Paul had taught the practice of the head covering at an earlier visit to Corinth, and Paul commends here the church at Corinth for maintaining the traditions he had taught them. And there was some need for reinforcement, it seems. Let's read here. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head covered, uncovered, dishonors her head, since it's the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For a man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man independent of woman. For as woman was made for man, so man is born of woman, and all things are from God. Judge for yourselves, is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. I want to begin with a word about traditions. Paul commends the Corinthians for maintaining the traditions that he gave in verse 2 of our study passage. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I deliver them to you. The Greek word here rendered traditions is the Greek word paradosis, a giving over which is done by word of mouth or in writing. Other English renderings of this word are ordinances or teachings in the NIV. Many of us today have a bit of a negative impression of the word tradition. I believe that you, that may be because we associate traditions with traditions of men, or Jewish or Amish or Mennonite traditions. Tradition means simply something that has been passed along. That's what it means. It's, an, its origin can be either a human origin, and some Jewish traditions were that way, or some Amish and Mennonite traditions are that way. 
It can also be a teaching or practice that were given under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that's the case with the head veiling. 2 Thessalonians 2.15 says, So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Paul had taught and handed down the teaching or ordinance, or tradition, if you will, of the head covering to the Corinthian church, and was now commending them for keeping it. Some of them obviously were, some of them uh, not so much. We have traditions that have been passed on to us at our church that we keep. It's not a bad thing. Not if they are based on teaching coming from God through His Word or, or scriptural principle. We need to go back and examine those traditions that come to us with no scriptural backing. Are they something we want to keep on using? The woman's head covering is not one of those. The head covering tradition is firmly based on scriptural teaching here in 1 Corinthians 11. Okay, what is the head covering that 1 Corinthians 11 is talking about? What is he talking about? Uh, Some people would say he's talking about the covered head. He's talking about the uncovered head. He's talking about long hair. He's talking about short hair. He's talking about nature uh, teaching us or angels getting involved in the discussion. And there are three possibilities. Um, Something worn on top of the head, which is primarily the teaching here. The long hair, which is also being taught here. And uh, some people will say possibly a husband is your covering. Uh, It's kind of tough to carry out that tradition in in a literal sense. I was impressed with the definition that Wikipedia gives. Whoever wrote it in Wikipedia uh, did a good job here. It says the Christian head covering is the veiling of the head by women in a variety of Christian traditions. Some cover only in public worship, while others believe they should cover their heads all the time. The biblical basis for head coverings is found in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 2 to 16. That's our study passage. Though head covering was practiced by most Christian women up until the 1960s, it is now a minority practice among contemporary Christians in the West, although it remains the norm in the East. The Greek terms that Paul used when referring to the covering, as well as evidence from Corinthian culture and in the early church, indicate that Paul is primarily referring to a piece of cloth worn over the woman's head. Historically, this has been Christianity's primary understanding of the passage from the early church to the present. Early church fathers and historians confirm that this was the practice of the Corinthian believers and the New Testament church. Those uh, confirming this would be Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Hippolytus, and Jerome. What about the teaching of some that the woman's hair is actually the head covering that Paul is referencing in this passage? It is mentioned as a covering. This seems to be an easy out for some who are uncomfortable with the teaching of a cloth covering on the head. Two head coverings. The confusion is cleared up when we understand that Paul is actually talking about two separate coverings in 1 Corinthians 11. Verses 4 to 10 reference a covering that a woman puts on her head. Verses 14 and 15 make reference to a covering that nature gives, which is the long hair of the woman. Paul makes reference to a nature's covering of the long hair to clarify the teaching on a cloth covering that a woman puts on her head. We must make a distinction between these two coverings if we are to understand this passage of Scripture. What are those distinctions? Number one, when they are worn. A woman's long hair is a continual covering, worn 24 hours a day. It's not put on or taken off, not frequently. It is permanently attached. Who puts it on? Uh, Paul tells us that the long hair covering is put on the woman's head by the creator of nature, God himself. 
verses 14 and 15 of our study text says, Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory, for her hair is given to her for a covering. So God puts it on. Nature provides the long hair covering. The cloth covering is a covering put on by the woman herself, or maybe someone assists her sometimes. Number three, how the wearing is taught. The teaching regarding woman's long hair is somewhat innate. Paul says that it is taught by nature in verses 14 and 15. Women usually have longer hair than men, regardless of their religion. <laughs> the cloth covering is not taught by nature. It is taught here by the apostle. Number four, it's relation to religion. Use of a cloth head covering is not naturally intuitive. Rather, it is a unique practice taught by Scripture. Christian women use it for distinctly re spiritual reasons, verses 2 to 10 of our text. Nothing necessarily religious in long hair. Number five, its purpose or effect. The fifth distinction between the two coverings is shown by the role that the covering plays, their purpose or effect. Long hair is an adornment and a glory. Verse 7 and 15 of our study passage says, For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image in glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. But if a woman has long hair, verse 15, it is her, is it, it is her glory, for her hair is given to her for a covering. The cloth head covering provides the opposite effect. It conceals or covers glory. The contrast between the two coverings, cloth and long hair, is seen in verse 6. For if a wife will not cover her head, that would be put on a cloth covering, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a woman to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. Here Paul describes a woman who does not cover her head and who subsequently also cuts off her hair. At this point, the woman is missing two separate things, the head covering and also her long hair. In the original Greek text, Paul describes the woman's covering of, her, of hair using a completely different Greek term than the covering that she wears on her head while praying. There are two coverings here, the long hair which occurs naturally the cloth covering, which is put on for religious reasons. And we need to understand that fact and not to confuse the two. The first part of the, our passage is talking about a cloth covering, and the last couple of verses uh, use the example of the natural covering or the hair. Okay, let's move on then to the bas basics of this scriptural teaching of the head veiling. Paul uses at least five basic arguments for the covered head in 1 Corinthians 11, 2 to 16. Notice that these are timeless arguments. They're good for the first century and for the 21st century as well. Number one, to show the headship order. That's the number one argument or te uh, argument in this teaching to show the headship order verse 3 but i want you to understand that the head of every man is christ the head of a wife is her husband and the head of christ is god for man was not made for woman but woman for man neither was man created for woman but woman for man nevertheless in the lord woman is not independent of man nor man of woman for as woman was made from man so man is now born of woman and all things are from God. God has established an authority structure that begins with himself. God, Christ, man, woman. This structure does not denote value, but establishes order and authority. The Godhead has an order of authority even though each member is equal in value. In the Godhead it's that way. God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit equal in value, different in order. So it is here on earth. Man is not more valuable than woman, but has been tasked with authority by God. The woman's role is under the authority of man. This authority structure was set up by creation. First Adam was created, then Eve, 
Eve's purpose for being is to be Adam's partner and helper. Verses 8 and 9 of our study passage says, For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. I suspect that one of the reasons for the disfavor that the head covering has fallen into in our day is because of women and men who do not accept God's headship order. The women's liberation movement has been, had an impact in our American culture and in our American churches. It may be an unconscious thing, even. They may not even know why it bothers them. Some of the other reasons may be a desire to blend in with our culture. It may also because, be because of the stigma that the Muslims and other Eastern religions and cultures have brought to the head veiling due to their mistreatment and disregard and denigration of women. <clears throat> The headship order set out here by the Apostle Paul does, does raise some additional questions. What about single women? Whose authority do they fall under? Do they need to wear the head covering? How on earth, how early should young ladies be to cover their head? The best answer I have is that yes, singles should wear the head covering. And perhaps their father, who is their authority figure, should figure out when they have reached the age of accountability. Older singles do well to honor the godly men as their head, perhaps their father or a church elder. There are some difficult situations out there due to ungodly fathers or missing fathers. The wearing or none wearing of a head covering shows the divinely instituted headship order. It shows a certain acceptance of that headship order. It shows a certain submission to authority. Women, woman to man, man to Christ, Christ to God. This bothers some people and they reject the symbolism along with the practice. It is not something that Mennonites, this practice of the head veiling, have come up with. But it is the divinely inspired word that Paul wrote down for the Corinthian church. It was the practice of all the New Testament churches as attested by the early church fathers. It was the practice of many evangelical churches, even in the West, until about the middle of the 20th century. It is still the practice of many Eastern and Far Eastern evangelical churches who will wear the head covering, at least in church worship. So that's the first um, argument or teaching regarding the requirement for the head covering is, is the headship order. Secondly, for glory and honor. Um, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 4 to 7 says, Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, which, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Glory and honor. First, an important translational note. The ESV translates the Greek word gune here as wife. Other translations use woman. Can be either, depending on the context in which it is used. It seems to me that the situation may call for the broader English word woman, which is used by the King James and the New American Standard Bible and others. There are churches who interpret this as wife and require the head veiling for married women only. I saw that just this past week as the school board, I'm, which I'm a part of, interviewed a young lady from the Russian Baptist Church. Um, the, they basically uh, would practice the head veiling in worship uh, as married women, not the unmarried. When we engage in worship, it is important to show the glory of God and to cover the glory of man. When we pray or prophesy, when we engage in any kind of worship or communication with God, we are to show this, this uh, glory of God. Worship is intended to show the glory of God and not to usurp that glory for man. We prostrate, prostrate ourselves, at least figuratively, 
figuratively before God and give him glory. Every man who prays or prophesies with a covering on his head dishonors Christ Jesus, who is his head. Paul says that when men cover their head in worship, they dishonor Christ. We show men honor, we men show honor to God when we expose our bare head in a worship experience. We are his direct representative. Because we are directly under God authority, under God's authority as men, we show his glory by an uncovered head. The head of man is Christ, and his glory is always to be shown. We dishonor our head Christ when we cover his glory and worship. The bared head on the part of a man is a symbol to show the glory of God to any and all who may observe. So what about hats and ball caps and weather protection that we men use? The easiest answer to that kind of covering is that that kind of covering has no religious significance. For the same reason, a covering used by a woman such as a ball cap or a protective scarf or a decorative hat may also not serve as a valid head covering. It has no religious significance. We don't associate it with religious practice. It has no religious meaning. It doesn't mean anything to those who observe. As, as an example of a head covering on a man that does have religious significance is the Jewish kippah, or yarmulke, worn by devout Jewish men. You know what I'm talking about. On our Holy Land tour a couple of years ago, we men had to wear the yarmulke to approach the wailing wall of the temple when we visited there. We were not praying or prophesying at that time. If I wear a yarmulke in worship, it would dishonor my head, which is Jesus Christ. The practice of removing hats and other protective headgear for prayer or public worship is more of a cultural thing in this country than obedience to the word. That ball cap or hat has no religious significance. A wife or woman should cover her head in prayer or especially when leading out in worship because of who her head is. That's man. Man's glory should be covered and the glory of God exposed in our worship. Verse, 11 of our, verse 7 of our text, For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man and should cover her head in worship. That glory of man is to be covered during our worship experience. Christian women should put on top of their head a head covering that is obviously a religious symbol. The size of that covering is somewhat sensitive in our setting due to different convictions that we have. The placement on top of the head is meaningful due to the headship principle. When should a head covering be worn by a Christian woman? The Bible says for praying and prophesying or worship. Our position as conservative Mennonites has often been that we wear the covering continuously when practical. I'm okay with our position on this, although I would be slow to judge other groups who wear the covering only in public worship. That is the direct scriptural command while praying and prophesying. So th those are the first two arguments for the head covering that the apostle gives to show the headship order, number one, for glory and honor, number two. Number three, because of the angels. Verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 11 says, That's why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angels. I'm not sure what that means. I'm doing some surmising about what it means. May mean. The word doesn't say what this means. The angels, good and bad, are concerned with authority structure. The corrupted angels fell when they rebelled against God's authority. We are a witness to them with our submission to God's authority and plan for us. Ephesians 3.10 says, So that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. The angels are watching what we do. When angels are in the presence of God, they cover up with their wings. This could have 
possibly some significance. If you have a very... If you have a very difficult thing to explain to your children, you have my permission to use Paul's argument here. It's because of the angels. How can they argue with that? Number four, nature's teaching about hair length. Let me read again verses 13 to 15 of 1 Corinthians 11. Judge for yourselves, is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory, for her hair is given to her for a covering. Natural hair lengths present a hint for what Christian men and women should do regarding the use of head coverings. A woman's hair will naturally grow longer and thicker than a man's hair. It will hang around longer as they age. <clears throat> It's a natural glory to a woman to have long hair. It accentuates her femininity. It's a beautiful thing. It is God's design through nature for women to have long hair. Paul says that it should be obvious that it is for her glory to wear long hair. Does this mean that her hair is not cut at all, is it's uncut? Perhaps. I would not judge personally. It simply uses the term long. If a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him. Paul, under the Holy Spirit's inspiration, says it is, and I couldn't agree more. It's not a tough thing for me to agree with the apostle here. Not that it matters so much what I say. I just happen to agree strongly with Paul here. This is not the forum for me to dictate the exact length of hair for you men, just to state the principle. Long hair is a disgrace for you men. It just is. If you want my opinion, come ask me. Generally speaking, if in doubt, get a haircut. God provided a model here for head coverings through nature. Women, longer hair, their head should be covered with a cloth covering. That is obviously religious insignificance. Men, shorter hair, they should not be covered with a covering of religious significance when they worship. The passage provided for only one outcome. If a woman won't cover her hair with a religious covering, she must cut her hair off in verse 6. doesn't make sense any other way. But since nature teaches that this would be a disgraceful loss of her glory, verse 15, she should cover her head, verse 6. Number 5, the universal practice of the church. In the English Standard Version, it says, If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. This is a bit confusing. He just argues for the head veiling, and then he says, If anyone is contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. This is an incorrect translation. The New American Standard Bible says it this way, If, if anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice. That's the correct translation. We have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. The practice of head covering for women in worship was universal in the early church. Paul says it here. It's born out of the writing, writers of the early church fathers. In the next centuries following this writing, they all practiced this head covering for women in the church. This practice was not the custom of the culture of that day. It was a practice of the church. The Jewish people had a different practice. Their men were a covering for worship. The Corinthians, the Corinthians surrounding the church had also a different practice. The Romans had a different practice. This practice was a unique practice of the church set up by the apostles under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The excuse that's used, that was just a practice of the culture of that day, is not true. It was not the cultural practice of that day to wear the head covering. It was a practice set up by the apostle for the church. This practice is not culturally dated. It's timeless. The principles behind it have not and will not change with the cultures that rise and fall over the years. Paul did not present this as a cultural issue or dictated by the practices of the day. This practice is timeless in its principle and application. 
This practice is based on creation principles, the way God made us. The exact parameters of the covering and the way it is worn is probably not as important as the fact that it is worn in a way that is meaningful, in the way that it is intended by the inspired teaching of the apostle. Okay, I want to wrap up with just a couple of thoughts. Ladies, I'm not shouting at you today. I'm not shouting down at you. I'm not shouting at you, period. I'm not superior. I'm not more holy. I'm not more intelligent or godly. I am teaching the Word. If we don't follow the teaching of the Bible, what do we have? We have nothing else. God will bless us as we, as we are faithfully obedient to the clear teaching of the Word. God bless you today.